Right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Victoria McPhail and I'm the coordinator of the Centre for Bee Ecology, Evolution and Conservation at York University in Toronto, Ontario. And I'm happy to be here today in a partnership with uh, Dr. Lawrence Packer of the Packer Lab at York University to help present this Bee Biogeography and Systematics Talks. Um, it's a series we have every month and we encourage you to sign up um, for all the upcoming talks over the next few months and to tune in live on the uh, last Wednesday of each month. Like to post in the chat where you're from, it's always interesting to see um, really extent of the global audience we have. Generally, we do have people from literally all around the world. Um, so we see how many continents we can have represented today. Oh yes, feel free to post in the chat where you're from. This is a Zoom webinar, so only the panelists can turn their camera and microphones on. Please use a Q&A box, as you can see in the very bottom of your screen, the ones with the two little conversation bubbles, and post the questions there. And at the end of the talk, then uh, Dr. Packle will post the questions back to our speakers. Please use a chat box sparingly. Right now, again, you can use it for sharing where you're from. But once we get into the talk, please use it just for sparingly or for general comments. Again, questions should go in that Q&A box. If you have any trouble, you can do a private message to myself via the chat or email bc at yorku.ca. We are going to record this presentation and post it online to our YouTube channel. Uh, so check that out and give us a follow so you'll be notified whenever new talks are posted. I do want to take a moment to acknowledge that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the ter territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tikranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Metis. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples. And we acknowledge the current treaty holders, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Jishwood One Spoon Wampon Belt Covenant, agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. But not everyone is located in Ontario or even in Toronto. Um, so please take a moment to go to native-land.ca. This is a website that globally um, will show you, generally speaking, um, who are the ancestral caretakers of the land, who have you know, um, treaty rights in certain areas, um, perhaps areas where you're getting your energy from, your specimens from, where you're currently working in. So it's helpful to you know, browse to see what's going on in your part of the world. So I see from the chat, we have people from Germany, the US, Kenya, uh, Washington, DC, Costa Rica, uh, Manitoba, Canada, Pennsylvania, US, Georgia, US, Brookings, um, Oregon, Maryland, US, many different people across multiple countries um, and states. So yes, thank you all for joining. And again, I encourage you to check out and consider um, the caretakers of the land past and present for your area. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Packer to introduce our speakers today. Well, hello world. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, night, depending on where you are. Uh, it gives me great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Manuela San and uh, her two colleagues, Seema Al-Gilani and Louisa Tim. Um, Dr. Manuela San started her career as a technical assistant in chemical and biological laboratories of Alette Verein in Berlin in 2004, completing her uh, bachelor's degree in biology in 2009 and master's in ecology, evolution and conservation in 2012, both at the University of Potsdam. She followed this with a PhD in biology from the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin in 2017. While completing her PhD, she also worked as a scientific assistant in zoological research at the Museum Alexander Koenig Center for Molecular Biodiversity Research in Bonn. From 2017 to 2021, she was an assistant professor at the Albert Ludwig's University of Freiburg and is now a postdoc and project coordinator of something called Insect Mau at the University of Hohenheim in Germany. Today she will also be joined by her colleague Seema Alkilani, a PhD student, and Louisa Tim, one of her employees, who will help speak on two new projects that are based on the phylogeny of Apoidea that they have both been heavily involved with. So with no further ado, uh, ado I will stop talking 
get, hide my picture so that you don't get put off your lunch. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about the apoid wasps. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for this really nice introduction. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a really a pleasure to to give a talk um, in your seminar, uh, especially talking about um, airport wasp and, of course, bees. And this talk today is um, actually divided into three parts. And I would like to start with a, um, introduction um, or an overview about phylogenetic relationships and the sister group um, of bees. Um, and based on this uh, phylogeny of um, the whole group, Apoidea, I would like to hand over to um, uh, my new PhD student, Sima Akilani, who will give you a short introduction into our new project uh, studying secondary phytophagy in uh, airport wasp and bees. And based on um, at this, we also want to present you a project in the third part um, uh, in which we um, use direct observations in the field and DNA barcoding to studying feeding ecology in airport wasp and bees. Um, so first of all, I want to start with um, yeah some nice pictures of um, airport wasps and bees, and um, probably you will notice that there are also some other accolades included. So um, most of you, or uh, all of you, probably know that um, airport wasps and bees are belong to the group of the accolades, the stinging Hymenoptera, and here you can see some nice representatives um, of accolades and um, some airports, as you can see on the left left side and some bees, of course. And um, now I want to um, start with a um, yeah short introduction into phylogenetic studies and uh, not really introduction. Um, I want to mention something because um, in the last uh, recent uh, or in the last 10 years, there were a lot of phylogenetic studies. Um, uh, mostly all of them are based on molecular data. And um, I think this is a, a really amazing um, progress we made in the last years here. And we had a lot of really nice studies on the group of Hymenoptera, for example, and on a lot of different groups within the Hymenoptera. And based on all these studies, we have a really, really nice overview about phylogenetic relationships within Hymenoptera and um, um, several groups or a lot of groups within the Hymenoptera. So this is amazing and I think highly important to keep on studying specific features um, that we can weed out of this phylogeny, uh, phylogenetic studies. Um, and this is, in my opinion, highly important. And even if there are some um, differences between these phylogenetic studies that are mainly based on differences in the data sets or data analysis methods, um, I think it's, um, um, it's, it's, it's really amazing that we have these really nice studies. And um, with this, I want to come to um, a short overview um, on the phylogeny of the stinging Hymenoptera or Aculates. Um, here you can see uh, uh, three studies um, that, and I just picked out the part of the stinging Hymenoptera. Um, the first, or the, the one above by Johnson and Peters et al. is based on transcriptomic sequence data, and the one um, by Brandstetter et al. Um, was based on ultra-conserved element data. And as you can see, um, there are some um, slight differences between these studies. Um, uh, we have some sister group relationships that are, differ a little bit, but um, the, the really good thing is that we can see that most species group together um, in specific groups that um, we present within the stinging Hymenoptera, the uh, Chrysidoidea, um, that are probably not monophyletic, um, the formerly known group of the Vespoidea splitting up in um, a lot of, um, or not a lot, <laughs> in several um, groups now. Now we can see the arms um, as sister group to the group of Apoidea, and this is the group I want to focus on um, today, um, and comprising the airport wasp and bees. Mm, I think it's nothing new for here, but 
uh, for you, but um, just to give you a short overview about these two groups. So within the apoid area, we can find the apoid wasp and the bees. And apoids, there are around 10,000 described species, and we have much more for the bees, around over 20,000 described species. Within the apoids, we can find several families, um, and within the bees, we have seven. Um, and the big difference between both groups is actually the feeding ecology. So apoid wasps, um, or mostly all of them, um, feed on pollen and nectar as adults, and um, they provide their larvae with terrestrial arthropods. Um, this is a big difference to the bees, and um, most of them are, um, as I call it, um, or sometimes um, called um, they are mostly, all of them are pollinivores. So they provide their larvae with pollen and nectar. Um, um, and instead, uh, while airports um, provide them with terrestrial arthropods. But um, here you can find exceptions. There's one described to provide their larvae with pollen and nectar. So it would be great to, um, um, yeah, to get an idea whether this is really true or not. So um, I have never seen the species um, probably won't ever, but who knows. And um, yeah, so this is, I think, the big difference between both groups is the feeding ecology. Um, within um, the phylogeny um, or the study I want to present to you, um, um, the main goal was to identify the sister group of the bees and to reconstruct phylogenetic relationships uh, within the group of apoidae. And to do so, we generated um, a big data set um, based on molecular data. And here we included, or we started um, and with collecting a lot of species um, um, in the field. And we used um, either fresh or dry pin specimens um, to extract genomic DNA, or we used fresh or RNA later preserved um, um, specimens to extract um, trans uh, RNA. Um, and this would um, um, and in this approach here, we um, the, the, the extracted genomic DNA was either used for a DNA target enrichment approach um, and for a genomics genome skimming approach. Uh, the generated um, um, DNA uh, raw DNA was then sequenced on a um, next generation sequencing platform. For the um, lower part here, we um, used transcriptomes that were sequenced also on a next generation sequencing platform. Um, and for those of you who are not uh, familiar to this method, just a really brief overview. Um, DNA target enrichment is, um, I think, a really nice method. Um, in which we start with the extraction of genomic DNA. Um, this DNA is then shared into a fragments with a certain size. Um, you add adapters to the ends of these fragments, and then there's a really um, nice and important part. You add specific um, so-called baits. Um, they are also known as probes, and these baits have a specific sequence and a specific length. And due to these um, um, properties, they bind to specific regions of the fragmented genomic DNA. You can then capture these bait DNA um, um, fragments using magnetic beads, and you can remove all the DNA you are not interested in. So you can sequence less. This is um, uh, only the, or you can sequence only the DNA you are really interested in the target DNA. To do so, we um, um, when we started this project this was in I think 2012. Or something like this, um, there were no baits available for non-target species like airport wasps are, or were, <laughs> I have to say. Um, so we had to firstly um, um, develop a software package um, to be able to create these baits um, that we can use for this approach. Mm. We also, um, so when we, or uh, maybe I have to start in a different way. So when we performed all the data analysis and um, everything was done more or less. So we see, we received, or we were lucky to receive three really important taxonomically, highly important um, um, species. And um, then the idea was to not again start with um, target enrichment. So because this is not, um, makes no sense for only three species. So we use the genome skimming approach to include these three highly interesting species into our data set. And 
To do so, we um, we shallowly sequence the genome um, of these three species, and that means compared to a target enrichment approach, as you can see here on the top, that you have a fragmented uh, genome assembly, and um, based on that, you can find um, you can um, mostly in all uh, for all our target genes of the enrichment approach, we found a counterpart in the shallowly sequenced. Uh, genome assembly. So we were able to add the same amount of genes um, to our data set received from the genome skimming. Um, and we were a little bit lazy, so we uh, also included transcript terms, and here we used the data set that were um, provided, um, kindly provided by the International One Kite Project, and we picked out the airport wasp and bees we were interested. So what we did is that we combined three data sets, the target enrichment, the genome skimming data, and the transcript terms to one big data set. And then we picked out um, um, specific um, genes, so-called single copy autologous genes, and then a really long bioinformatic pipeline uh, followed. So, and I will go through this step by step. No, this um, I won't do this. <laughs> so, if you're interested, we can talk about this uh, um, um, later. Or yeah, um, as you wish. But this was the, the the. This is just a really. Um, a summary of, of the whole approach. Um, but I want to mention that um, we tried to analyze or not, we tried, we analyzed on a concatenated anticolescence based approach. And we do a lot of different um, um, tests, um, not only the bootstrapping approach, and we performed a time calibration, but this is just yeah, in the background. Mm. Now I want to directly jump into the results of this uh, data analysis, and I've, I want to to start with the concatenated data set. So that means that all your genes, in our case, we had more than um, uh, around 200 uh, genes. Um, concatenated means that all of these genes were combined in one big data matrix. And here you can see the result we received on um, nucleotide level on the left side. Um, including or um, studying first and second codon position and the amino acid um, um, data set that was we, uh, uh, phylogenetic tree we received. Um, and what you can see is, I don't want to go into detail, but um, what you can see is that we got really congruent results. Um, but of course, um, we had the same thing, as I said at the beginning, some groups jumped. Um, but I think for our part, this is not the, the, the main point here. So what you can see is that Ampolisare, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it um, uh, correctly, are the um, closest extant relatives to all airport wasp and bees. This is the uh, this is a result that we received in all our studies. And then we have um, our species included, always grouped into the same um, um, clades. This is um, a really good result, irrespectively whether we analyze the nucleotide data set or the amino acid. But for us was to identify the sister group of the bees or to come closer to um, um, to the sister group of the bees. And for the concatenated data set, um, irrespectively whether we analyze nucleotide or amino acid level, uh, we found a group, the amoplanide, to be the closest extant relatives to the bees. And here bees are represented on the top um, um, as entophila. And here you can see the uh, sister group to um, the bees. Um, same here. When we go to the coalescence based approach, um, I also don't want to go into detail here, but we got the same result. Amoplanida, a sister to the bees for um, the nucleotide data set, including first and second codon position. Same result for the um, amino acid data set. Um, so at the end, we received a lot of phylogenetic trees, but we always got the same result. Um, um, this is really, I think it was really, uh, we were really happy about this. And we were also very happy about that mostly all our species always grouped into the same um, group, like, for example, uh, Malinida. Uh, um, 
um, sad needle and so on. So this is really cool. And again, of course, there were some differences um, between the groups. So sometimes the sister group of so, uh, some groups change a, a, a little bit, but um, to come back to our main goal to identify the sister group of the bees, I think we were um, very happy that we always received the same result. Amoplanida um, in our study um, were the closest extent relatives. So let's have a look at this group. Um, here you can see a really nice picture of a representative um, of the um, Amoplanida. Um, they are really, really tiny. Um, um, Airport wasps, they are around two to four millimeters in size, and they have a wing vein reduction, as you can see here, and a really nice, huge pterostigma. Um, there are around 130 uh, species and uh, 10 genera, um, genera, and they are worldwide distributed. Okay, so at the beginning, to be honest, it was a little bit surprising, and we were like, okay, so. <laughs> What, what what's next so and then we had a lot of discussions and we um yeah thought about a lot of things and talked um to a lot of people and then um we came or we made um two assumptions and the first assumption we made was that um we can assume that um based on the result we received um that probably um the last common ancestor of the bees was a, um, a very small um apred wasp that um was preying on um and this is the important uh, part here probably um, arthropods that were sitting on um, uh, flowering plants. And assumption came um, from the result that, um, well, it's nothing new, but that um, the evolution of the bees was in the early Cretaceous. Uh, we calculated in the early Cretaceous 128 million years ago. And this was the um, um, time when the flowering plants um, uh, came up and um, diversified. So um, we believe that the last common ancestor of bees was an um, um, and an airport wasp that was preying on arthropods sitting on flowering plants and feeding on the pollen that was provided by the first flowering plants. And um, based on this assumption, we can also assume that um, the, the larvae um, of this um, um, early bee um, started to not only feed on the um, arthropods that were collected, they were also start to feed on um, the pollen these arthropods were covered in. And um, maybe this was um, um, the first step um, for the transition from an airport wasp to a bee um, based on the transition um, um, in the feeding. Um, and um, there's also another point um, um, that uh, maybe is interesting when we go for the size of these um, 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 extant relatives, they are quite small. Um, in a really nice study by uh, Danford um, and Pana, um, they described um, a, a fossil that um, in Burmese amber, and they described this fossil as a transition of form between airport wasp and bees. And for us, it was highly interesting because they described it as a really tiny um, um, animal with a size of two to four millimeters. So maybe this somehow supports our theory that the last common ancestor of bees was small in size. Okay, so uh, to conclude this, um, we found um, in our phylogenetic study um, that the bees are deeply, deeply nested within the airport wasps. So actually they are airport wasps. <laughs> um, they, we also found the divergent time of bees in the early Cretaceous, 120 uh, million years ago. And um, we identified um, a group, um, the Amoplanida, as um, um, likely extant sister group to the bees. And based on our phylogenetic study, we suggested, um, based on the assumption that we want to find natural units um, to um, grant major clades uh, family rank. Um, of course, so within the airport was, not for the bees, of course. <laughs> um, 
I want to also mention that, of course, there were some differences between um, our phylogenetic trees, but it was always on a group level. So some groups um, jump around and it's still an ongoing issue. Um, and I think depending on a research question, it's, it's not a big deal, but depending on a research question. So we always have to keep in mind that phylogenetic studies are, um, yeah, they, they are, are subject to, sh to change. Um, with this, I want to, um, of course, mention a lot of people who helped a lot with this uh, phylogenetic studies uh, study. And um, here I want to especially thank my former supervisor, Michael Owell, who enabled this project and who enabled me to uh, conduct this project. And I also want to mention, uh, especially mention Oliver Nihus, who um, supported me um, and helped me a lot within this um, work. Um, okay, so based on the phylogenetic relationships we received, I was highly triggered to keep on studying uh, um, um, the transition from an apoid wasp to a bee. And within the Hymenoptera, we can find a lot of dietary transitions, either on an individual level, like, for example, ontogenetic dietary shifts, but also among lineages. Um, so, for example, we have the soft lights um, to as uh, yeah um, um, uh, closest extent relatives that are uh, phytophages, um, and um, we have the parasitoids, and we again have switched um, to a secondary phytophagy, for example, within the aculates. When you have a look at the mazarines, um, the pollen wasps, or the bees. So, and this is for me a highly interesting point and here I want to um, say that um, there was currently a really nice study published by Blamer et al um, on key renovations and the diversification of Hymenoptera and they also um, had a look on diversification within the Hymenoptera and they had um, several traits like the stinger and aculates or parasitoidism and um, also a secondary phytophagy. And this is um, a thing or a trait I'm also highly interested in. And with this, um, I want to, um, yeah, to, to, um, um, show you um, um, and well, present you a new project um, uh, we currently started on recurrent genomic dynamics and secondary phytophagy in Hymenoptera. It's a um, collaborative project between Mark Lammers from the University of Münster and um, myself and we have um, a really um, um, nice and I'm very happy about our new uh, PhD student um, Sima Alkilani who uh, will give you some uh, brief insights into her new uh, project. So I would like to hand over to Sima. Thank you Manuela. Uh, hi everybody, uh, my name is Sima and I'm a new PhD student in University of Mannheim. And today I will uh, present to you uh, my PhD project with the topic recurrent uh, genomic dynamics linked to parallel evolution of secondary phytophagy in Hymenoptera, which is a part of genomic basis of uh, evolutionary innovations uh, funded by German Research Foundation. Uh, so I will start talking about the diversification of Hymenoptera. You can skip <laughs> minute. Okay. Uh, the order Hymenoptera is one of the most diverse animal lineages, uh, but it's still unknown if uh, specific key innovations have in contributed to its diversification. These innovations, like a uh, wasp waste of upper carita, stinger of accolade, parasitism, and secondary phytophagy. So, in our project, we will focus on secondary phytophagy. Uh, which has occurred multiple times across hymeniptran uh, phylogeny and have been linked to increase uh, rates of species diversification. So it's very important to understand and study the genomic basis of dietary transition in insects, especially hymeniptera. So in our project, we want to understand the evolutionary process that contributed to the diversity of dietary transition and adaptations in uh, Hymenoptera and 
we have uh, two main questions in this research. First is parallel evolution at the phenotypic level reflected by parallel genome evolution. And second, did similar genomic innovations appear when independent lineages release convergent deity transitions? So to answer uh, these two questions, we aim to uncover genomic innovations that are linked to fundamental transitions in insect feeding ecology. And we will focus uh, on, the, on two groups uh, within Hymenoptera order that chose uh, secondary phytophagy, especially acolytes and uh, parasitica. So within acolytes, the most fundamental dietary transition uh, to secondary phytophagy has evolved within whispered wasps and uh, the apoid wasps. So we will focus on these two groups. Uh, here, I want to mention that uh, there are already available genomes, uh, but we want to sequence new genomes that are not available yet. Uh, so we plan to uh, compare genomes of two lineages of pollen feeding insects with their closest Zophagos sister lineages. In case we cannot get the target uh, sister lineages, so we will sample the next, next closest lineage for that. And also we could include uh, pollen feeding stingless uh, bee and sister lineages as a third event of parallel evolutionary transition in feeding ecology. Uh, we also interested in trigona, and here I want to say I will be very happy if anyone could help us to collect fresh samples uh, of trigona species. Uh, so we could uh, include it to our research. So uh, the project, uh, in this project, we will collect fresh samples. We can, yeah. We will collect to uh, we will collect fresh samples and uh, then we will prepare the samples in the lab for genome and uh, transcriptome sequencing and bioinformatics. And the project includes three work packages. First, we will study the co uh, correlation between uh, change in genomic features and evolutionary transition toward phytophagy. For that, we will do statistical analysis on gene family evolution. And then we will have an overview about the candidate genes. And then we want to test if these genes have gone through positive selection that lead to the evolutionary innovations or if they experience relaxed selection because of uh, gene mutations or duplication. And finally, we will study the link between transposable element dynamics, uh, gene regulatory networks, and uh, gene functions. Uh, as a first steps this year, uh, we will start collecting uh, samples in Germany uh, in June, and then uh, we will start uh, extract DNA and RNA uh, preparing the samples for uh, genome and transcriptome sequencing. And also end of July, I will attend the 10th Congress of International Society of Hymenopterus in uh, Romania. I'm very excited to exchange knowledge, also to meet people who can help me to collect fresh samples like Trigona. And uh, finally, I want to hand over to my colleague, Louisa Tim, who will also attend the Congress and present her project on DNA barcoding of bee and was a collected food resource. In her project, Louisa analyzed the food resource collected by wasps and bees in order to gain more extensive knowledge uh, on their feeding ecology and to generate interaction networks. With this, I want to hand over to Louisa. Your mic is off. Sorry. Yeah, thank you, Zima. Um, yeah, I say hello, everybody, from my side as well. My name is Luisa, and currently I'm working together with Manuela on a project, like Zima already said, where we deal with DNA barcoding of B 
be and was collected food sources in order to find out what wild bees and wasps actually need, um, how we can better support them and in the end better protect them as well. This project is a collaboration between the University of Hohenheim and the Natural History Museum in Stuttgart and is funded by the Stiftung Naturschutzfonds, which is a foundation for nature conservation here in the federal state of Baden-Württemberg in Germany. Yeah. Um, in the project, we mainly work with nesting aids, as bee and wasp communities in these nesting aids interact directly with their close surroundings. And when we access these nesting aids, we can get lots of information about their stability against environmental influences such as plant biodiversity losses, animal biodiversity losses, or even change climatic conditions. And as you see here on the picture, there are a lot of cool things to discover when you open up nesting aids and trap nests, and we hope to find a lot of things when we do this. Yeah, next slide, please. Um, the goals of this project are first um, to establish a monitoring method that is effective and allows us to study cavity as well as ground nesting wild bees and wasps and their collected food resources. We want to do this to collect more in-depth knowledge of essential foraging resources and want to identify essential ecological parameters and characterize the quality of habitats. And with this, we then want to formulate recommendations for insect-friendly habitats. And these we also want to pass to the public so that more people get the awareness of how insect-friendly habitats actually look like, what people can do even in their private life or in their gardens to improve habitats for wild bees and wasps and other e insects as well. And another topic is that we want to identify wasps that may serve in the end as natural pest control agents. As Manuela already said, they don't feed their brood with pollen, but with arthropods. And some of these arthropods, of course, not all, but some of these arthropods are very detrimental pests for our agricultural fields. It would be very good to know which wasps are actually feeding on these arthropods and if we could use these wasps to establish a more natural protocol to do something against these pests in our agricultural fields without using pesticides. So in the last couple of months, we were installing our nesting aids. We were installing three nesting aids in the close surrounding of the University of Hohenheim. We installed two in the botanical garden and one in a fruit orchard, which is close to the University of Hohenheim and close to agricultural testing fields of the University of Hohenheim. The good thing is that all these sites where we put up these nesting aids are field mapped. So we know exactly which herbaceous plants and which trees, which bushes grow there and can be a possible food resource for the bees. Yeah, um, the nesting aids themselves, they are built up in a modular system. So we have different models which are filled with different nesting material, such as reed, or we have boreholes bore holes in, um, in, in, in wood, as well as these trap nests, which you can open so that you can actually access the um, nests without destroying them. And we also added sandboxes to address species that normally nest in scarp slopes. And we added pithy stems for species that nest in these vertical um, pithy stems. Yeah. So when we use these trap nests, we will, we will open them. And we see the sea on the picture quite well that different sized species use different sized boreholes. So for example, Osmia beaconis is a quite big species. So it's using more bigger boreholes than for example, the wasp species, Senulus fusipinus. But we can address them all by different borehole sizes and can include them in our data set afterwards. When we take our samples, we will do that quite carefully. So we will not take everything. We will do it less invasive, as less invasive than possible. We will only take one larva out of each row and we take food resources from one brood cell so that the other cells uh, are not touched and can develop into adult bees or wasps even after our samples, uh, taking our samples. 
Then we want to identify the samples. We want to do that morphologically as well as genetically in the lab. For the genetic identification, we use normal Sanger sequencing as well as next generation sequencing methods as the Illumina sequencing or the nanopore sequencing using the Manayan. Um, and with the Manayan, we want to try different protocols. And if we manage to establish a protocol which is used with, where we can use the Manayan with, this would be very handy because the Manayan is very cost effective. And then very many people could profit from this and could use these protocols to do, um, yeah, to identify beast and wasp species from nesting aids. Um, these protocols we established in this project will then as well be used in another project, which is the Multitroph project, and this project takes part in China. Yeah. Um, so now, now let's have a look how these um, different sequencing methods, which advantages they come with um, regarding our project. When using Sanger sequencing, it's Sanger sequencing is always useful if you have not as many samples and you can singularize the samples. Um, and this applies quite well when investigating brood cells of wasps as they bring arthropods. And these can be very easily singularized. Um, yeah. So we will we will identify them via sequen Sanger sequencing, but we will also identify the wasps larva and the potential parasitoids which are in the brood cells. When we have identified them, we can also count them. And then based on this data, we can set up these trophic interaction networks, which show well which resources were used by which wasp species, which parasitoids were actually found in the brood cells, and where we have overlaps between species. So where different wasp species might use the same food resources for their brood. For example, here the, in pink, the wasp Pasaloicus corninger is using the same aphid species, Cnidaria pini, as the here in yellow showed um, wasp species, Penurus fusipenis. We can also see in these networks which species might be more important for the wasp species. For example, again, for the pink um, Pasaloicus corninger, the Aphid species, Aphis sambucci, was probably more important at this site than, for example, the species Biopelma firsteri. And if we had more information about the food plants of these herbivores, we could even expand the network by one level and make the picture even more comprehensive. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, when investigating bee collected food sources, Sanger sequencing is very quickly reaching its limits. Of course, we can identify the bee larva and the parasitoids by using Sanger sequencing, but when it comes to pollen samples, it's very hard to singularize them. So, therefore, next generation sequencing technologies such as Illumina sequencing or nanopore sequencing are here the method of choice. And with these technologies, we can then process mixed pollen samples and can get qualitative results on which pollen species were found in which brood cell. Um, there was a bachelor thesis dealing with metabarcoding uh, last year um, in this project where they compared morphological pollen identification by a specialist with metabarcoding and the metabarcoding reached a quite high re resolution on species level. Um, and with this, we can again draw these trophic interaction networks. But here we will have only a quali qualitative um, result and not a quantitative result. But as in our project, the focus lies on the question how the collected food resources are composed dependent on the habitat they were found in, and if the close surrounding of the habitat uh, of the nesting aid reflects and is reflected in the collected food resources, um, already this qualitative approach is very helpful to answer our questions. So metabarcoding will 
be the method of choice when we look at we collected food sources in our project. Now I'm already done with um, this little project um, introduction. And to sum up the talk today, we can say that there are several different ways to study the feeding ecology of a specific group. Um, first, there are these phylogenetic trees, which Manuela introduced to you, which help to entangle the evolutionary history of trophic ecology of Hymenoptera. Then we have the steadily increasing field of genomics to uncover genomic innovations that are linked to fundamental transitions in insect feeding ecology. And last but not least, we can also go for direct observations in the field to resolve these trophic interaction networks. And when putting these all together, we can reach a quite comprehensive understanding of what is actually out there and what is actually going on out there. And now we really hope that you enjoyed our shared talk. And now I would open the time for questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you, all of you, all three of you, for that interesting talk. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come up. Um, John Asher points out that not everybody agrees that 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 melitosphex is very closely related to, to bees. Um, and the question is, if the oldest fossil bee was minute, why do bees of several families, actually most of them have complete wing venation. So um, would you like to comment on that? The amoplanids have got really reduced wing venation. Um, anyway. Yeah, this is actually a common question to this. So I know that mellitus vex is, um, yeah, highly discussed. <laughs> I have never seen it. So, um, but I don't think that this is a big problem in, uh, you have, we have this armor um, planeta that are the closest extant relatives. So I have no idea how the last common ancestor looked like. So, um, but I don't see a big point um, in, even if the wing reduction was um, also applicable for the last common ancestor, I don't think this is a big thing here, but um, I mean, Amoplanus is like the extant relative, so no idea how the last common ancestor looked like, yeah. I know this is a, a, a good question and I, I, I can't answer this in, um, yeah, in a better way, I would say. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Spencer Moncton has a question for Seema. Um, and he says that Aurustidae are parasitic sawflies, sawflies in inverted commas, perhaps wood wasp is a better name for them, which are frequently forgotten when discussing parasitism and phylogenetics. Will you include any Aurustids in your sampling? Uh, okay, actually, to be more specific, um, we will focus on uh, Calcidodia uh, in Parasitica, not sawflies. Until now, we don't uh, think to include it to the research, but maybe uh, in the next steps, we will change our mind. Yeah, maybe I will, I will go here in. Um, um, first of all, we will focus on the Calcidodia and the Aculates, um, but um, um, at the end, we also want to include as many genomes as possible. Um, of course, um, they are highly interesting and um, the idea is to, um, depending on the time of course, um, to be, we want to um, include um, all Hymenoptera uh, that we were able to get. So, but we have a focus on Calcidoidea and um, um, Aculates um, for the first phase of the project. So in relation to that, how is it that you need your specimens um, stored, right, for, for you to be able to do this work? You need fresh in, in liquid nitrogen, alive in absolute ethanol. What what works? So um, liquid nitrogen would be the best, of course, um, but probably hard to realize when you're in the field. So um, when there is a way to get them in, in pure ethanol, and um, we also need some in uh, RNA later that we can um, combine um, um, the transcriptomes with the uh, genome um, data. Um, so 
this would be the best. So fresh, um, pure ethanol, um, 100%, and um, on a later preserved specimen. So this would be the best because, of course, liquid nitrogen would be amazing, but I think it's um, mostly not feasible in the field. So, um, yeah. Well, back in the Middle Ages, I, I did, before people could sequence DNA <laughs> easily, I, I, I went, I, I drove around the Atacama Desert with a liquid nitrogen container in the yeah, back of the truck. <laughs> so if any of you want to go to Chile, my liquid nitrogen container is still there. <laughs> wow, I can give you all sorts of advice on where to go and what the good restaurants are and what the <laughs> great meals are, etc. Um, <laughs> okay, so Tanner Bland, uh, Bland asks, uh, maybe I missed it, but how would you go about separating nectar from pollen DNA to sort out whether a bee is nectaring or collecting pollen? That would be important in evaluating the extent to which species are oligolectic or Oh, yeah. etc. Louisa, do you want to? Well, the problem, of course, is that you cannot really, I think you cannot really distinguish when you um, do the meta barcoding like this because you get everything what is in there. Um, but as they feed, as I know, feed more, the, they feed their, their um, brood on pollen, there will be more pollen in the nesting, in the brood cells than nectar anyway. Or what do you think, Manuela? Yeah, so actually we, we try to combine it with um, um, a morphological identification, but yeah, we go for pollen here um, and not really for nectar in this regard. Um, but of course, for meter backwarding, we are not able to say that um, what we can found, uh, what we have found is um, was really uh, collected as larvae provision or whether the bee was um, in between having a snack or something like this. This is true. Yeah, this is not um, possible with the method at the moment yet. So I, I, I guess that if you get a pollen that's present in really small quantities, maybe that's an indication that yeah. that came from a nectar source rather than a pollen yeah. source. This is true. The thing is for the uh, for the uh, porch we use currently, uh, we are not able to say something about the abundance of the uh, pollen uh, we found in the data. But um, we had we have a, um, 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 someone um, who is able to help us from time to time with a morphological identification of the pollen. So. Um, by combining both, we got an idea about um, the pollen that was really collected for the larvae and what was um, included just by yeah accident, for example. Super, thank you. Um, Mark Hoffman uh, asks, which are the most primitive bees and what are their plesiomorphies in terms of nesting provision ecology that link them to apoid wasps? Um, Sima, do you want to say something about this or um, otherwise I can do it? Maybe you can answer this question. Yeah, so I think we will go for uh, Maletida um, um, in this regard. They are the closest um, um, or um, most common ancestor to all bees. So for us, they are the most interesting ones. Um, but I don't know whether this answer your question. Um, and I have to mention that um, I'm more an airport wasp person, so <laughs> I'm not totally in um, in um, the nesting behavior of all bees. Um, so, <laughs> so maybe someone else can help out here who has more experiences than I have. Well, I, I, I can say something about the morphology of these things. So... Yeah. Everybody knows that in bees, or not everybody knows, but I think <laughs> some people know that in bees, the the female's seventh um, turgum is divided into two hemiturga um, with no sclerotized strip joining it together. In the apoid wasps, there's a sclerotized strip, uh, strip that joins it together, except <laughs> in some pemphredonines. And I yeah. think, because I did this work 20 years ago, um, <laughs> and I haven't read it recently, but I think also in some amoplanines, um, they also have uh, 
you know, the, the thing is shaped like this with a, and it, and it doesn't meet as a fused uh, sclerotized strip. Now, the interesting thing to me is that in melitids, the middle part of the, of the hemitergum is not properly fused to this strip here. It kind of sticks out a little bit. So it's almost as if it's an intermediary state, but that mm -hmm. is very speculative. It's a, one single character compared to the several million you get with the DNA sequencing people do, do these days. But it is an interesting observation that most people, if I ever read that paper, have forgotten. Um, okay, so Jesse Whiskin uh, says, great talks. Are you aware of or do you expect any associations between nesting habit and phytophagy? nesting habit and phytophagy. Um, so I have to think about this question. Maybe you can uh, rephrase it a little bit so um, that I totally understand what you um, are referring to. Um, well, I guess a lot of phytophagous hymenoptera don't actually have a nest. Um, but I could also say that phytophagy in bees as, as a nest, you know, I think people d argue about whether okay, the brood cell a... lining in, in bees is an adaptation yeah. to, to help stop the pollen going moldy or not. And that might also explain why bees are more diverse in semi-arid areas. But I think the apoid wasps are also most uh, most uh, abundant in semi-arid areas so that doesn't really help us very much yeah so yeah hopefully we can say more about this question when we started the data analysis but it's a good point um yes okay. i think we could include it to our research as a part yeah. sounds good yeah uh, jacob straka asks how pollen collecting could have evolved in the maserine wasps Yeah, this is a good question because they are very outstanding. Um, of, yeah, probably I, I, I don't want to say something that is, makes no sense. So probably uh, um, we have to answer this also uh, when we have started our um, work here. But maybe someone has an idea about this. So I can say answer this question um, without being speculative, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Right, Jacob also had a follow-up question. It's about Crombinictus. Um, yes. Point in that was the you mentioned that there was a crabronid. I think it's, it's would be called a crabronid now. There's yeah. so many families of these wasps. I can't keep track of them all. You keep changing the classification around on me. Um, but that that if I'm right, that species nests in twigs. So you might you might put some of your trap nests up in Sri Lanka and see if you can get some. Yeah, this is a nice idea. I was also thinking about this, but um, we will never get um, a permit to do so. Um, and we also have to deal with Nagoya. So I totally agree, this would be so nice to do this, but I have no idea how to um, get the permits to do this uh, you, research. You yeah. need a collaborator in Sri Lanka. If there's, if there's anybody listening to this talk from Sri Lanka, we want to hear from you. Um, okay, Brian Danforth. Hi, Brian. A question from Manuela. The classic hypothesis is that bees arose in Western Gondwana, Africa and South America, in brackets. Do your results based upon the ammo planets provide any insights into the geographic origins of bees? In other words, what does the geographic range of anaplanid wasps suggest about bee origins? I think as far as I know, um, they are worldwide distributed, so they are not located in specific areas. So um, I think, so I have um, just a short, I oh, know he's not around. Probably Michael could say more about this. Um, so 
So probably I'm not able to answer this in detail, but I think it's Gondwana theory um, um, applies to, to this as well. Uh, so there are, there are some species of ama planted in South Africa, right? There are. We also have some in Germany. Um, they are more or less really wide distributed and in South Africa. Yeah, yeah. So I think they are really widely distributed. So it's not inconsistent. Mm, with... As far as I know. So, and yeah. I expect that um, because of theirs very small, that not all of them are um, documented now, but they are really widely distributed. Um, but it's hard to say because we do not have that much information about this group and just the, the, the distribution of this group. Yeah, they are really small. Yes, this is the problem. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, my bet is most specimens of them are probably put amongst the braconids and the, and the calcidoids in, in collections that people have. Maybe, yeah. Carefully. Might be, yeah. Uh... Uh, Patricia Landerverde Gonzalez um, asked, you mentioned that the determination of food source of wasps and bees will only be qualitative. Uh, I understand this is due to all the limitations to really know the quantity of each sample detected, but I read there are some proposals of how to obtain some relative quantitative or semi-quantitative determination. Are you planning also to, to try to obtain some relative quantitative determination or semi-quantitative or leave it only as qualitative and there's a she sends a reference um yes we we have planters um so um currently we try to establish um good protocols for us and we want to go for the um um Actually, we want to go for PCR free method and metagenomics um, um, that help us, for example, with the um, an iron to be more um, um, specific and quantitative um, um, uh, in regard with the or in, um, with the pollen. And um, I, as far as I know, there were some good um, um, studies where they already showed that we can find a connection between uh, wheat count and um, um, uh, wheat count and uh, um, the species you identify. So um, there's a way to quantify it. Yeah, and we we will try to establish this in our protocol. Yeah. Um, so Jesse Hewiskin has, has modified his question. He's he's interested in you know, are there any patterns with the ground nesting or stem nesting? amongst the herbivorous and uh, the carnivorous apoidia? Yeah, um, um, actually we uh, we work on this. So we have a lot of data collected and what you have seen here is just like a um, short summary of the preliminary work. Um, um, yes, we can see some differences and hopefully we will come up with a paper soon. <laughs> yeah. All right, look forward to seeing that. <laughs> Okay, are there any more questions? Type it in quickly if you want to uh, have a have another question. There are, at the present there are no open questions. Um, a question what, from what, earlier in the chat was from Patricia. Which species of, which species of trigona do you need? How many individuals? She's got trigona fulviventris in Germany. So I'm going to talk to Patricia. Get in touch with Patricia about that. Trigona species, if you're interested. Um, yeah, if uh, I would be happy if we can, uh, we will make up our minds. Um, but actually, we are um, always interested in around five to ten species um, for the um, ethanol. And um, uh, regarding the species, um, it depends. Um, actually, to be honest, uh, we need someone who has a permit and um, we need a Nagoya thing. So we are interested in this um, um, group, but um, we need someone who has all these permits and everything that we can process the species. So I would be happy if we you just drop us an email and we can talk about this in, in detail. So this would be amazing. Um, all right, so Patricia has sent her email address to you in a in a chat. So, um, but you know we can we can get you both in touch with each other if if, it, if you don't see that. 
Uh, Michael Owl comments that uh, Anoplanids are holarctic and Ethiopian. So I guess no Australian or South American ones have been found yet. Yet, um, yet. This is the problem. So we have actually, I um, um, have no idea how they are distributed. So, um... well, we're talking about sampling. Um, one of your compatriots uh, in golf, Stefan de Winter, has got a project in Peru. And uh, he has the, he must have the necessary permits to get material out because I've seen photographs of some of it. Um, so whether they, you know, they're not collecting in absolute ethanol, but I'm pretty sure that if you ask nicely, they might be able to, uh, to arrange to bring some out. They're, they're doing a transect up the eastern slopes of the Andes. So I guess you'd be most interested in the stuff that's lower down. Uh, yeah, Manuel, your sound is turned off again. I don't know. Thank you. It's... Yeah, this is um, a good recommendation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Janasha, can you comment on the divergence in the sister group of bees as found by re various recent studies, especially phylogenomic studies? Um, John, do you, can you do you mean in time or the number of the number of species or genera or the the different sister groups in different phylogenomic studies. I didn't, I'm not quite sure what you mean there. Different groups in different studies. Okay, so John's pointing out that different studies have suggested different sister groups to bees, um, even using phylogenomic data. Okay, so this is a question or? Um, yeah, you know, so, so he, he, John's suggesting that different phylogenomic studies have suggested different sister groups to bees, and, and he'd like you to say something. Okay, yeah, I can say something to that. Um, um, as I said, there are always differences between phylogenetic trees, and this is based to different data sets, different data analysis methods, and so on and so on. Um, um, no, I'm not really aware about the study that um, came up um, with a totally new um, result. So I would be happy if there is someone who, uh, if you can yeah, send me um, um, this paper or whatever. So because I'm not totally aware about um, the publication you're referring to. So um, it would be helpful to have an idea about it. Okay, um, maybe maybe John can send uh, send some links to the papers or citations. Um, yeah, this would be interesting because I know, yeah yeah this would be great. Um, so and I have I had another comment um, about the the dietary stuff. So the, in the in the New World tropics in in the not that's not the right word in the western hemisphere tropics we've got some stingless bees that use carrion uh, yes. as food um, and i'm wondering whether that might be interesting for you to look at in the same i guess this is for sema in 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 the, in the similar genomic type approach um, my guess is that the folks in the smithsonian tropical research institute in panama should be able to get you some yeah, Sima, this is uh, correct. So we talked about this. This would be amazing to include them. Yeah, it would be so helpful because they are so special. Yeah, and then in Thailand, you got those ones that seem to get the protein they need from the from the lacrimal gland secretions of yeah of, um, of, of vertebrates. Uh, I don't know about the permitting regulations in Thailand, but Hans Banziger, he must be getting on for 80 now, um, but he, he, he's, he's sent me specimens of, very, of those bees for barcoding, so he might be able to get you some of those too. Yeah, this would be great, but um, I'm always afraid, a little bit afraid about the permits and everything, so, because we need to um, have permits for this to right. conduct uh, Jacob Stracker asks, some cuckoo bees are also carnivorous, like Liapodus, but also partly Epioloides. So there's some 
other things that you can look at. Now, E.P. Aloides, you can get locally uh, in oh, okay. Germany. Okay, I wasn't aware about this. This is a good um, hint here. I will write this down, or maybe you can also drop me an email um, again, because this is a good good part. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and Liapodus, the folks that go and teach the B course down in Arizona, that, that B crops up pretty regularly. Oh, this is good because you you are then we do not have a problem with the Nagoya <laughs> protocol when it's in Arizona. This would be great, yeah. Sounds sounds right. really good. <laughs> okay. Well, that was great. What a lot of fun. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank really you. I, you know, that's that the, the discussion seems to have been useful. And uh, if there's anything I can do to help you, because I, I love the stuff you're doing, uh, just let me know. Uh, yes, it's not that will. I've been traveling much lately, because since COVID, I've been using all of my risk credits on uh, <laughs> going to visit my granddaughter in France. And the bees in France aren't as interesting as they are in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> um, apologies to everybody from France in the audience. <laughs> um, so you get lots of nice comments in the chat. Oh, uh, really? Uh, everybody had a good time. <laughs> um, I think the chat comments are all kept, right? And so you be, you might be able sure. to see them okay. at a later date. This would be great. So thank you so much. It was really, You're really welcome. Nice really to meet the three of you. <laughs> thank you. Good luck with all your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. And now over to Victoria, who's going to put in a plug for the next talk. Yes, just putting a plug in. This is an amazing talk. So tune in next month for another amazing talk. This one's by Dr. Mar Margarita uh, Lopez Uribe, uh, The Ecology and Evolution of Squash Bees and How Humans Have Influenced Their Recent History. So visit www.yorku.ca slash bee slash packer if you sign up for this talk. Um, we also have one coming up in May about uh, oil collecting bees uh, by Dr. Antonio Ag Aguirre. Apologies for mispronunciation. And we have another talk uh, in, in June, we just don't have a title for that yet. Um, but visit the yorku.ca website and be happy to have you sign up for this talk. Again, also follow our YouTube channel and subscribe and you get notification whenever we post talks from this series or any other uh, presentations we may host. So yes, thank you all again very much um, for coming today and see, see you all next month. Great, thanks a lot. <laughs>